Hi, uh, my name is Gregory Bratman. I'm honored to be here and uh, thrilled to take part in this symposium, so thank you for having me. Um, I'm going to be talking to you today about the impacts of nature experience on mood uh, and emotion regulation and a little bit about cognitive function. Um, and mostly I'll be focusing on experimental work that I've been conducting at Stanford. Um, and since I've been doing experimental work, I thought I'd do an experiment with us right now. Uh, first of all, can everyone hear me with this uh, with Paul mic? Okay, all right. So um, I'd like each of you to picture yourself in this spot for a moment and just think about how you feel and what's coming to mind for you psychologically. And now I'd like you to picture yourself in this spot and do the same thing. Was there a difference for any of you out there? Okay, good. Those are the sorts of experiments I like to do. <laughs> so what I'd like to think about together today is why some of us, many of us in this room, had a different set of thoughts and feelings in those two different contexts. And we'll be talking about some evidence that demonstrates the way in which natural environments may differ from urban ones with respect to impacts on our psychology, and I'll be drilling down into a possible causal mechanism that I'm exploring that involves emotion regulation. And for our purposes here today, emotion regulation basically means how we deal with and change our emotions. <clears throat> in terms of the environments we'll be thinking about, for the most part, we'll be comparing uh, urban experience um, and nature experience with respect to its impact on affect or mood um, and emotion regulation. Now, of course, the environments that we live in today uh, are increasingly a mix of both urban and nature. And as those environments are coming together, so too um, are ecologists and psychologists. As we begin to really focus in and try to understand how we can secure and improve the well-being of people in nature, especially in this crucial phase ahead as urbanization takes place around the globe. And we have to think about uh, how to bring nature into cities, how to conserve it outside of cities, and what the repercussions for well-being, psychological and otherwise, will be if we fail to do so. Uh, and as Howie pointed out, um, the impacts of the natural environment on human well-being have considered in a variety of ways for many hundreds of years, whether it be the aesthetic components of landscape design, healing gardens and hospitals, horticultural therapy, or of course, religious and spiritual traditions over the past hundreds, if not thousands of years. One paradigm that has sort of gained traction in conservation science circles uh, lately is the idea of ecosystem services. And this idea is basically uh, focuses in on the uh, the way in which ecosystem processes and the species that exist within them benefit humanity. Um, for instance, forests and wetlands protect us from floods, purify our water, sequester carbon to help regulate our climate, um, provide us with food and energy. And I want to think about today how we might start thinking about the uh, benefits that these ecosystems provide to us in terms of mental health or psychological well-being. Now, <clears throat> there are three global trends afoot today that make this question especially urgent in my mind. Um, the first is the rate of urbanization. Uh, we recently passed the halfway mark um, where 50% of humanity lives in cities. By 2050, we'll be getting close to 70%. Um, along with this trend comes another trend on a global scale, which is this increased rate of, uh, or decreased rate of uh, ability and uh, opportunity to interact with nature. So, decreased nature exposure, increased urbanization, and a third global trend, which is in some cases of anxiety and mood disorders, an increase in people who live in urban areas um, of these disorders, especially um, some which include depression. So um, correlation does not uh, imply causation necessarily, but we can see there's a space here to look at what uh, nature experience may be giving us and what uh, the repercussions might be if we're losing nature experience in terms of our mental health. So to dive a little bit into some experiments that I, I ran to start to look at this question, um, we wanted to try to design a, uh, a carefully controlled uh, experimental design with contrasting real life experiences for participants, where people would be randomly assigned to either a nature or an urban experience, and we would test them before and after observe the affective or mood consequences, and drill down into this possible causal mechanism I'll talk about. So for our first study, um, we brought 50 people, uh, uh, 60 people, pardon me, into our lab, and we randomly assigned them to a 50-minute walk. 
Um, and we tested them before and after the walk. Now these were urbanites and suburbanites in the Stanford University area. And the walks were equidistant from the testing place. So the, uh, the nature walk was a sort of uh, green space with scattered oaks and shrubs. And the urban walk was along a sort of busy four lane, uh, not highway, but uh, thoroughfare through Palo Alto, California. The experimental design was pretty straightforward. We tested these participants before. We shuttled them a, a short shuttle ride to the walk. They went for the walk, which they were randomly assigned to. We shuttled them back and we tested them afterwards and we looked at the differences between the groups. What we did is we told them they couldn't listen to music, they couldn't text their friends, they couldn't get on social media, they had to give us their phones. We gave them a phone, not so that they could do all of the things we told them not to do, uh, but for two reasons. One, we could give them a cover story about what it is they were doing. We told them, just take 10 pictures of whatever captures your interest. We really want to know what those pictures are. Didn't really want to know what those pictures were, but it helped sort of hide what we were up to. And we also could track the phone to make sure they actually went on the walk and didn't go into Burger King and <laughs> come back 15 minutes later. And they all went on the walk. The pictures did help us uh, see that they went on the walk as well. And so these are actual participant photos from the walk. So this is the nature walk in the urban green space near Stanford University, taken by participants. And this is the urban walk. And we can see there are some trees on this urban walk, but one, I think we can all agree, is more urban than the other. Um, and for this first study, then, we just looked at mood results. So we saw, how did one group change differently than another group? Um, and what we saw in self-reports, so these are questionnaires that have been used in decades uh, in psychology, is we saw there was a drop in self-reported anxiety, a drop in self-reported negative uh, affects. So these are questions like, I feel distressed or upset, irritable or sad and an increase in feelings of uh, positive affect or positive mood. Um, I feel inspired, interested, enthusiastic, and determined. So the nature group reaped these benefits, whereas the urban group did not. We also wanted to dig into this emotion regulation aspect of things. So this is another sort of uh, pattern of thought or way in which people think. And there are adaptive forms of emotion regulation and maladaptive forms of emotion regulation. I don't have time to delve uh, deeply into this literature, but I'll tell you about the one that we concentrated on, which is a maladaptive form of emotion regulation known as rumination. And put simply, this is a focus on negative aspects of oneself in a repetitive way, a sort of looping kind of thinking. Um, one question on this questionnaire is, my attention is often focused on aspects of myself I wish I'd stop thinking about, or I always seem to be rehashing in my mind recent things I've said or done. Unsurprisingly, this is associated with negative mood. Um, but it can also be a risk factor for depression uh, for some people. And I'll call to mind those three global trends afoot today with urbanites experiencing increased depression and less nature experience. So that drove our, uh, our, our desire to look at rumination. And we found self-reported rumination to go down in the nature group as well compared to the urban group. So this was great insofar as it gave us this controlled experimental design. But because of the intensity of these experiments, the time intensity, um, we have, we're restricted to pretty low sample sizes, 60 people, 30 in each group. So we wanted to continue to dig into this rumination finding and up our sample size. We used another method in, a, in our next study known as structural equation modeling. And put simply, this allows us to examine pathways. So our work and plenty of others has shown that there's this relationship between nature experience and affect or mood. Um, usually one of, of a beneficial uh, relationship as it relates to nature experience. Um, but what we wanted to do is look in the middle there and see, can we explain this um, by the decreased rumination that we observed in our other study? So we, uh, we took a survey. Uh, we gathered information from 605 participants. We measured their time in nature. Um, this question was, on average, approximately how many hours per week would you consider yourself to have interacted with nature? For example, walking outside, gardening, camping, fishing, etc. We asked them about their positive and negative affect. Um, affect means mood, in case that hasn't been clear with my repeated uh, statements there, and rumination. And we, we took a look at this uh, relationship and tried to see if there was something in between there that might help explain it. So first off, we found um, the relationships we would expect to find between rumination and affect. So uh, increased rumination was associated with decreased positive mood and increased negative mood, which is what we would expect to see. Uh, and uh, we also found, and sort of replicated that finding that we found in the first study, that those who spent more time in nature tended to ruminate less. 
And we found what's known as an indirect effect with this sort of pathway analysis, a mediation effect, meaning we can explain the way in which hours per week spent in nature decreased negative affect and increased positive affect through a decrease in rumination, at least in part. So this is another hint that there might be a possible causal mechanism going on here as it relates to nature experience and its impact on decreasing this sort of maladaptive emotion regulation tendency. But as always, you want to keep trying to dig into things, see if you can replicate this finding using different methods. So we went back to an experimental approach. This time we took 38 new participants. We assigned them to uh, walks in the same environments, this time 90 minutes long, 19 in nature, 19 in urban. It was the same design. Everyone got a phone. And uh, what they did this time was they filled out the self-report questionnaire on rumination, the same one we've been using in the other studies. And we also loaded them into a magnet and uh, scanned their brains uh, using what's known as an arterial spin labeling resting state perfusion scan. Uh, and all that really means is it's a task independent scan. We put them in the scanner, we don't ask them to do anything, and we can get a quantitative measure of where people send blood in their brain. We were especially interested in one particular area of the brain known as the subgenual prefrontal cortex, because this area of the brain is associated with, among other things, ruminative thought. So if we observe a decreased self-report in rumination and a decrease in perfusion or amount of blood sent to that part of the brain in the nature group versus the urban group, this would be further evidence that uh, nature experience may be reducing this uh, really destructive type of pattern of thought known as rumination. These are just a few more questions off the questionnaire and the picture of the matting we use that was uh, installed in the basement of the psychology building. Um, and this is how the, uh, the method works. You label the blood as it enters the brain, and you're able to trace where it goes. It's sort of a PET scan type of um, procedure, but you don't have to introduce any kind of agent. So we did this for everyone before and after their walk. And again, we looked at the changes between the groups. People were given phones, taken pictures. Nobody went to Burger King. And we saw a decreased in self-reported rumination in the nature group versus the urban group. So we found that again. And in addition to that, we did find uh, a, a decrease in perfusion to the subgenual prefrontal cortex in the nature group versus the urban group. So more evidence here of, uh, of, of the possibility that rumination is is really a, a key uh, part of what may be going on in terms of helping to explain why people feel better um, after, uh, after a nature experience. It could also help explain cognitive function results. So one thing I haven't brought up yet is in study one, the one with 60 participants in which people were randomized to 50 minute walks and we tested them before and after, we also ran a verbal working memory task. Now decreased rumination can actually uh, be uh, <coughs> have, a, as a result, increased working memory performance. Because when one is ruminating to a high degree, one's working memory tends to be taken up with these thoughts, these maladaptive, looping, negative, self-referential thoughts. And when one has a decrease in that rumination, often one can observe that in increased working memory performance. So we wanted to do that task as well. We ran what's known as an O-SPAN task, an operation span task, which may be familiar to a lot of you in the room. But uh, simply put, this is a dual span uh, memory task, meaning um, you have to solve math and memorize letters at the same time. It's exceptionally difficult, and I score very badly on it. Um, and I'll give you a, a little uh, primer on what it looks like, and it's about this speed. I don't have the precision of a laptop, which is what these people take it on. Um, but it looks something like this. True or false? Letter. True or false? Letter. True or false? Letter. True or false? Letter. What were the letters? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'll just say, in order for your letters to be counted, you have to score at least 75% on the math. Otherwise, everything's thrown away. So that's the sense in which it's this dual process kind of test. Um, so we tested these participants before and after both the nature walk and the urban walk, and we looked at the change between the two groups. So I'll just show you a bar graph that illustrates the way in which the two groups changed differently. We can see here the nature group remembered on average 10 more letters after accounting for answering all math questions correctly than did the urban group, which exhibited basically no change. So out of a total of 75 letters after the nature walk on average, uh, participants remembered 10 more letters. So this was striking to us as well. 
Uh, our sample sizes are not big enough here to be able to determine for sure if rumination is mediating this, but at the very least we observed this, um, this effect of working memory going up with these uh, uh, people who are randomly assigned to the nature walk. Um, there are other ways of looking at this, of course. Um, again, as Howie spelled out, there are many different types of studies one can do. So this is a cross-sectional study which provides its own sorts of uh, traps and dangers that uh, we can talk about offline. But just to blast through what we've do, done here in conjunction with the Nature Conservancy, we're working on this. We've taken 500 representative schools in California. Um, and for every school, we're able to drill down, get a land uh, footprint using satellite imagery, and get the trees and shrubs footprint as well in 750 and 1,000 meter buffers. We can talk about why we chose those buffers, but it was to try to capture um, view shed, um, the experience students had coming to and from their school. Um, so they're rather large buffers. But we took those buffers and we were able to get a tree and shrub percentage. And then take a, um, the stats were a little bit more complicated than this, but to take a kind of regression type approach and control for the things that one normally uh, needs to control for that do typically predict test scores, um, take those out, create a composite score with fifth grade state uh, test scores, standardized test scores, and see, could we explain any of the variation in these test scores through the degree to which trees and shrubs were around these urban schools? And in fact, we could. For every two standard deviations increase in trees and shrubs, there was a 3% higher score observed. That might sound small, but it's on the level of what uh, our socioeconomic status measure was. So um, it almost makes up for that in a certain sense, although I would never go as far, so far as to say that. But in terms of this cross-sectional study, it did. Um, of course, we need to ask ourselves, why does nature experience reduced rumination? And this is a, a question I hope to uh, explore um, in detail in the coming years. Um, so we've been talking about the ways in which urban environments differ from natural ones in terms of their impacts on us. Um, what are the relevant ecological features responsible for these impacts? One could think of things like sounds, visual features, smells, other sensory stimuli, haptic, um, cognition cues, which I don't have time to go into today, but I'd love to talk about if people want to afterwards. Um, things like crowding. Um, and is it the absence of harmful urban elements responsible for these benefits or the presence of beneficial nature ones um, or some uh, intersection between the two? And how do those all come into play to uh, influence psychological mechanisms and what are those mechanisms? Rumination could just be one. There might be others like an adaptive form of emotion regulation uh, such as cognitive reappraisal which basically is reframing uh, incoming stimuli in a way that's typically put forth as a positive, adaptive way of dealing with um, my emotional life. So if I'm looking out and I see someone frowning at me, I might think they're disliking what I'm saying or that they had something bad for breakfast and uh, are experiencing indigestion. I'm going to have a very different emotional reaction depending on that interpretation, um, that reframing. Um, and I'll close with just some future directions which are going to touch on what other people have been saying here today. So I think we're coming to some similar conclusions about what we should be looking at in the future. Um, as I said, the relevant ecological features were the active ingredients of the environments that are responsible for these effects. The dose response curve, which people are making great strides on in this room. Um, and we need to think about how these effects differ for different people based on uh, personality traits, experience in nature in their, in their past, culture. Um, and we can explore this through a scenarios type of uh, um, uh, paradigm as well. If we develop in this way, what might be the psychological health repercussions of that development versus developing in another way in terms of urban sprawl um, and, uh, and design. And of course, we have to keep digging further and further into what the causal mechanisms are, what are responsible for these psychological uh, benefits that we're seeing. And eventually, I hope to move towards a sort of modeling um, a modeling frontier and a modeling technique where we can, we can currently model water purification and flood protection. Can we model the mental health benefits of landscapes? So thanks for having me. Thanks to everyone that helped uh, make my work possible thus far. And I look forward to talking to you. Later.